Hi guys, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York and today I wanted to do a little video about the subject of progression of atrial fibrillation. Okay, Now, the first thing to say is that uh, there is a group of patients who have atrial fibrillation who are generally young, who generally don't have any comorbidities, they don't have high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure, anything like that and who get atrial fibrillation which comes and goes. Okay, So they have either paroxysmal atrial fibrillation which comes and goes of its own accord or persistent atrial fibrillation which means uh, that they go into atrial fibrillation then they have to either have a shock treatment or they're given some medication and that pulls them out of the atrial fibrillation okay and they have these episodes intermittently um, and the thing about these patients is that they generally tolerate their atrial fibrillation extremely poorly. Uh, they feel absolutely yucky. They feel dizzy. They feel that they can't. They feel lethargic. They feel tired. They can feel breathless, uh, and their life is. They they it is horrible for them to be in atrial fibrillation. Okay, um, and for these patients, one of their biggest anxieties is. Could my atrial fibrillation progress? What if it progresses? What if it becomes permanent such that I can't come out of it? Uh, and what will that mean for my quality of life? Will it be that, you know, I'll lose all the quality of life I have because I feel so awful when I'm in the atrial fibrillation? I don't want to be like that all the time. And so a common question I get asked is, um, what uh, will my atrial fibrillation progress and how um, long will it take for it to progress. So I thought I'd do a video on this very subject to try and answer some of these questions. Okay, Now, the, uh, <clears throat> there was a very interesting paper published in 2007, Okay, and this was published in the Circulation Journal, and the lead author is Jahangir, J-A-H-A-N-G-I-R. Okay, And uh, this paper is entitled Long-Term Progression and Outcomes in Patients with low natural fibrillation uh, and <clears throat> basically what they did was they took a bunch of these patients who had low natural fibrillation. Low natural fibrillation means that they get atrial fibrillation but they're generally young and they don't have any comorbidities. So they took a bunch of these patients and they followed them up for 30 years to see what happens to these patients and the results are very interesting. So the first thing to say is that they found 76 patients with low natural fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation without any comorbidity. So these patients did not have diabetes, they did not have high blood pressure, they did not have sleep apnea, they didn't have heart failure, they didn't have thyroid problems. These were otherwise completely healthy people who were unfortunate enough to have this condition called low natural fibrillation, which would come or come and go of its own accord, i.e. paroxysmal, or would come and then they would need to come and get some medications or be shocked out of it, in which case it's called persistent. But basically, these patients were in normal rhythm and then intermittently would go into atrial fibrillation. Okay, uh, and of and these were all patients in this group of seventy six patients. They were all under the age of sixty years. All right, of these seventy six patients, thirty four had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which comes and goes. Thirty seven had persistent atrial fibrillation, which means that it would come. They would have to be shocked to given treatment to get them out of it. And five had permanent atrial fibrillation. All right. Um, <clears throat> and the mean age of this patient group was 44 years, all right? And these guys, Jahangir and his colleagues, followed these patients up over 30 years to find out what happens to them. So what did they find? And the results are extremely interesting and very reassuring, all right? Number one, they found that the, at the end of 15 years, 92% of this cohort of 76 patients were still alive, 92%. At the end of 30 years, 68% were still alive. Okay, These are very, very good figures and are comparable to a population of similar age and gender mix who do not have atrial fibrillation. So if you took a bunch of people who did not have atrial fibrillation of the same kind of age group, uh, you would find the same results. So these patients did not have any significant increase in death because they'd gone into atrial or because they were suffering from atrial fibrillation. So the long-term outlook is good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> by 30 years, 27, <coughs> 27 of these 76 patients had died. 
But what is really interesting is the 15 out of these 27 patients died because of a non-cardiac cause. They died because they developed cancer or they developed lung disease. They didn't die because they had a heart problem. Okay, 15 out of those 27. So that leaves you with only 12 people who died because of their hearts. Because they, <clears throat> And even in those 12 people, very few of them died because of the atrial, well, actually, hardly any died because of the atrial <clears throat> fibrillation itself. No one died suddenly. No one dropped down dead suddenly. We know that <clears throat> some of them died because uh, they developed a cardiomyopathy, because they were drinking excessively. Some of them died because they had heart valve problems. And five patients died because they had heart attacks. Um, <clears throat> so very, very few people died because of heart problems. And the ones who did die of heart problems probably died of heart problems which were unrelated to the atrial fibrillation or not caused by the atrial fibrillation. So a really, really reassuring outlook from a heart perspective. But the question really that I've raised is what is the progression of atrial fibrillation? So in this study, what they found is that at the end of 30 years, 29% had progressed to permanent atrial fibrillation. Okay, so 29%. So that means that 71% um, of these patients had not progressed to atrial fibrillation, uh, to permanent atrial fibrillation. Remember that five patients in the original cohort had permanent atrial fibrillation. They've taken those people out of the analysis. So they were left with 71 patients. Of those 71 patients, 29% had gone into permanent atrial fibrillation. 71% were still in either persistent or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. The ones who went into a permanent atrial fibrillation generally did so within 15 years, okay? And uh, <clears throat> what they found is that the people who went into permanent atrial fibrillation were generally older when they had their first episode of atrial fibrillation compared to the people who didn't go into permanent atrial fibrillation. So what that means is that if you have your first episode of atrial fibrillation at the age of 29, you are less likely to go into permanent atrial fibrillation in the long run compared to if you were 58 when you had your first episode of atrial fibrillation. Okay. The second thing to say is that they found that those people who had an abnormal ECG, when they were in a regular rhythm, when they were in sinus rhythm, the ECG had abnormalities, they were more likely to develop permanent atrial fibrillation compared to those people who had a normal ECG. So that's another... Uh, Thing that seems to um, uh, be associated with the development of permanent atrial fibrillation. The third thing they found was that actually if you have lots of premature atrial complexes or supraventricular complexes, these seem protective. So people who had these seem not to go into permanent atrial fibrillation compared to those people who, ha who didn't have them. So that's another interesting thing. The gender, the body mass index, uh, history of smoking, history of alcohol, history of caffeine use did not seem to have any impact on whether you remained paroxysmal slash persistent or whether you then went into permanent atrial fibrillation. So I guess the answer is that by 30 years, 30% 30 of patients will develop permanent atrial fibrillation. Patients who are older when they had their first episode are more likely to do, do so patients who have ECG abnormalities and patients who don't have much in the way of PACs, premature atrial complexes or SVEs, are more likely to go into permanent atrial fibrillation. Overall, a third of people will develop permanent atrial fibrillation at the end of 30 years. Okay. Now, I understand that people are very worried about how their quality of life will be affected if they go into atrial fibrillation, but the truth is many patients with um, many patients tolerate permanent atrial fibrillation much better than they tolerate paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. And the reason is that for the majority of people, the problem with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is that it can come on at any time. You know, it's that sudden change from a nice normal rhythm to an abnormal rhythm going fast. People tolerate that very poorly. But if that becomes your norm, the irregularity just becomes your norm then you tolerate it a lot better. And that's why people who are in permanent atrial fibrillation sometimes don't even know that they have atrial fibrillation. They tolerate it this well. So the chances of progression are generally low. And secondly, um, 
uh, even if you do go into permanent atrial fibrillation, chances are you'll tolerate it a lot better. So I hope this was helpful um, and answers uh, some of the questions that people have asked of me. Um, as I say, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist. If you'd like to speak to me, you can do so by visiting my website, www.yourcardiology.co.uk. Uh, I'm quite active on Facebook, so you know, please do come over and join uh, and uh, become a friend. Uh, and you can find me on Facebook by typing yourcardiology at gmail.com in the search bar, and I should pop up. I'm known as Dr. Sanjay Gupta on, on Facebook. And then I'm also on Twitter now, and my Twitter ID is York Cardiology. Um, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your kind words. Thank you for all the encouragement. Thank you for supporting my channel. It means so much to me. And in particular, today I wanted to say thank you to Linda. Linda is, uh, is a very, very kind and generous person who kindly took the trouble to nominate me for uh, the Pride of Britain, and uh, I clearly, you know, don't deserve it, and there are thousands and thousands of people who deserve it a lot more than me, but the very fact that you think of me in this manner make, means so much to me, and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, all the best, and uh, have a great night. Take care.